this Sunday when we begin with the session of Paul singing Hosanna. You know, uh, I'm of the age that when we do this, you know, what echoes in my brain is Hosanna, Hosanna. My wife and I have watched that movie in Holy Week in the New Year's Mary. It came out when I was a sophomore in college. And you know, the fellow that wrote it was not a Christian, and he was writing it, you know, to express that about the truth. And I think he was stunned when all these little Christian boys and girls in college with all this stuff. He went out and started buying it and listening to it and thinking that this confirmed to everything. When Jesus tells his disciples as they're entering Jerusalem to go and get him this donkey to ride on, it's an important thing. Because you'll note right after that, it says, Your king will come to you riding on a donkey on a colt. And this is an important thing. In the history of Judea and of the people of Israel, when times of conflict were on the horizon and it was possible that country might be headed to war, the king would usually go out with groups of his retainers and soldiers and meet with the opposing king and see if something couldn't be worked out to have peace instead of war. And when the king came back to Jerusalem, if he came riding in on a horse, they were going to war. And if he came riding in on a donkey, there would be peace and there would be no war. This was a kingly way of saying, turn yourself up for battle, or you can relax because we found a way to keep the peace. And Jesus coming into the city riding on the donkey is metaphorically a claim of kingship, as it were. And the people singing Hosanna and I just because he is bringing the ultimate peace. It's amazing to me, and I, I, I think it's always amazing, probably amazing also to others, is that we transition so quickly from this great celebration to the second gospel that we read, where the crowd that one day is singing Hosanna to the Son of David, now sings, let him be crucified. Jesus knows what has to happen. He'd like it not to have to happen. That's why he prays in the Garden of Gimothy, Gethsemane, Father, if there's some other way to do this, let's choose that way. But always he says, but not my will, but your will. The way he died is a terrible, horrible way to die. I don't know if any of you have ever, if you've ever seen the movie, the, no, it just fell out of my mind, the Passion of the Christ. That's a very accurate portrayal of the way he would have been beaten and then the way he would have been crucified. That's the way it happened. And generally, it took three days to die from being crucified. Because what you, the way you actually died was as your body became dehydrated, you couldn't hold your head up and you would keep bending over and over and you would actually close off your own windpipe and die from asphyxiation. It was an excruciating, terrible way to die. And yet Jesus, who could have he so desired, picked himself up off that cross, did not do that because he needs to do what he does, not for himself, not for God, but for us. There is something in us that needs that sacrifice for us. And that's what it is. Let's make no mistake. This is a sacrifice given 
for us. Blood sacrifice given for us. I don't know of any other religion who's ever said God loves us so much that he gives his own life for us. This is what God does for us as we come to this day and we read the story of Jesus' death on the cross. In less than a week, because it wasn't from Sunday to Sunday, it was probably on Wednesday that Jesus goes into Jerusalem. So on Wednesday, the people are singing Hosanna to the Jesus, on Friday, they're singing, crucify him. About 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he's dead. Now, I don't know if you paid attention to it or not, but it says, you know, there's this verse there, that when Jesus dies, the curtain in the temple is torn in pieces, torn in half, <coughs> from the top to the bottom. That's an important little detail. This curtain was what separated what we call the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple, and it was where once upon a time the Ark of the Covenant had been kept. Now, by the time we get to this time, the Ark had already been lost in one of its one of the times when Jerusalem had been conquered. But it was still this sacred space that only senior chief priest could go into once a year to pray for the people of Israel. And it was a big tall curtain. It wasn't just some little thing. It was tall. It was, you know, maybe 20, 30 feet tall. And if a person were to tear it, they'd have to reach it from the bottom and jerk it apart and tear it from the bottom to the top. And it tells us it's torn from top to bottom. That's God reaching out and grabbing that temple, grabbing that curtain and tearing it open in grief for his son. That's how much God loves almost impossible to comprehend. We are blessed by God in a way that is almost impossible to understand. And we know as we live in Him and He lives in us that death is not the last word for any of us or for any of God's Another word, that word is wealth.